can't hear anything. Kim, you've got to go. It's six o'clock in London. It's seven o'clock here in Torun in Poland. It's one o'clock in New York. 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 10 a.m. in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are in the world today. My name is Patrick L. Young. The IPOVID live stream series 20, episode 5, starts here. So, episode 119, first of all, let me say thank you very much for tuning in to watch, because I think today all the excitement televisually is on court TV across the USA. We've got Donald Trump, Hunter Biden, and SBF all in court today. More on at least one of those cases, of course, the SBF one will be in bit carnage on our Substack and Exchange Invest Daily as we cover the court case going forward. However, let's look at some really good news for the world of markets and also an IPO vid alumnus from episode 25, where we talked about the sustainable city and beyond. I'm delighted to see that my old friend, Professor Dr. Michael Minnelli, has been elected as the 695th Lord Mayor of the City of London. We're looking forward to being in London soon to celebrate that with him at his inaugural ball, which will be taking place in a couple of weeks' time, just after the Lord Mayor's show. Meanwhile, in another leading financial centre, Chicago, the Streetwise Professor, of course, also an IPO vid alumni, episode 93, Craig Perong was the Streetwise Professor Speaks, has been telling it like it is this week about everyday futures options, folks. Well, as most of the parish of Futures and Options folks have been getting a chance to don their best carbon fibre body armour and head downtown to Chicago Expo. PLY has opted not to attend, as you can tell, because I'm in Poland. But at the same time, it's very interesting because how long will there be a Chicago Expo? One wonders. Indeed, how long will there be a CME group that actually has a C that stands for Chicago? Texas's governor, Governor Abbott, is eager to offer CME Group a new home away from the high tax madness which has befallen Chicago's crime wave. Elsewhere, SEBI and TCS. Well, last week we erroneously told you the great news was in sight that TCS would finally be able to install their new software, taking away the long standing legacy of Jignesh Shah's original FT. TIL system, which was put in there at the dawn of MCX when he was actually the controller. After all that fanfare and excitement, we're now hearing that there's a court case ready to go demanding a one-year parallel operation of both systems. That sounds like the juiciest return in the recent years, apart from, of course, the several contract extensions that 63 moons have already enjoyed due to TCS being unable to deploy their system. Finally, a happier tale of some commodity innovation, albeit tinged with a little bit of analog sadness. Congratulations to the good folks of Intercontinental Exchange. They've completed the first delivery of London Cocoa using fully electronic warehouse house receipts and warrants. At the same time, sadly, in Nairobi, Kenya, the state is investigating 100,000 missing bags of premium coffee. Our guest today, Andrea Corcoran, knows all about many great and exciting scandals, having lived through them from the esteemed vantage point of having been the woman who actually founded the International Affairs Office of the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Hence our title today, Andrea Corcoran, Going Global, the Birth of the CFTC. Andrea these days is the principal of Align and advises the C-suite of firms and regulatory authorities across no fewer than five continents on various regulatory and policy puzzles. Her consulting services include the confidential evaluation of organizational structures and processes, development of regulatory and compliance strategies, training, adaptation to international standards, and much more after 15 years as a consultant. As I mentioned at the top of the show previously, she was, I do believe, the initial head of trading and markets. Certainly, she was one of the very, very first ones. And then she moved over to become 
the CFTC's first head of the Office of International Affairs, racking up the air, air miles at a time when it was a supremely exciting point in the nascence of the modern futures markets. Andrea, welcome to the show. Where in the world are you today? Well, Patrick, I today am in my office, which looks like the spaceship in Chevy Chase, Maryland, in the United States of America, but it's part of the DC metropolitan area, we, which some have called the swamp. So that's where I'm in. I'm in the swamp. The swamp. I think for the rest of us, it's always such an exciting revelation to discover that Chevy Chase wasn't just a comedian. It was a place to start with. It's, it's always interesting. It's a revelation in globalization for, for people who aren't aware of these sorts of things. It's like that moment when you learn that the Harlem Globetrotters weren't actually a team in the NBA, but we all thought it was when we were watching Scooby-Doo as kids. Um, it's a great office. I have to say it's the most beautiful background, quite stunning altogether. So, I mean, how, Andrea, did you actually manage to get drawn into this wonderful and exciting world of developing commodities and futures markets? Uh, well, I had been working, actually, uh, with a Los Angeles firm that was uh, had an offshoot here in, uh, well, in Washington and in New York. And the reason they had an offshoot in Washington and New York is that they were representing the trustee for the uh, non-operating property of the Penn Central, which was in bankruptcy. And the non-operating property of the Penn Central were, were the air rights that were above the uh, Penn Central lines in New York. So that included places like the Waldorf Astoria and the Commodore Hotel, which was one of Trump's first acquisitions and, and many other iconic buildings in New York. But somebody thought that because I was doing this work, uh, which was really mostly related to the real estate, that I knew would know something about uh, bankruptcy. And the CFTC was in line to uh, obtain authority to draft uh, well, both to participate on the technical amendments to the Bankruptcy Act, was, which was being uh, amended for the first time since 1948, and it was supposed to especially address financial markets, but also, uh, you know, that that uh, um, I would that they were going to get because they were considered to be by Congress way too complicated a market for Congress to figure out what all the rules should be. So they gave the CFTC special power to make their own rules with respect to bankruptcy. And that's why I got uh, hired at the CFTC. Special rules in relation to bankruptcy. Now that sounds like a huge can of worms being unearthed because of course the whole issue to modern day derivatives has been this issue of bankruptcy. I mean, thinking about actually wasn't wasn't that the reason why the the Deutsche Terminbörse had such a problem getting its debut because they were ready about the mid 1980s. But as I seem to recall, they had a problem because there was still a Weimar era act which said that essentially speculation on commodities and related instruments was the same as gambling and therefore they couldn't actually if i remember correctly they couldn't actually pin down um this in order to manage to sustain it in the courts and therefore they had to wait a couple of years until they could get the laws changed if i remember correctly so i mean it's a huge area the whole complexity of bankruptcy when it comes to dealing with modern derivatives yes i well, first of all, I would I, I would like to say this issue of wagering was an issue in the United States as well. And unlike the SEC, the CFTC, uh, the law, the original law, uh, the Commodity Exchange Act, and then uh, later on, a law that was expanded to cover over-the-counter uh, derivatives that are subject to regulation by the CFTC were structured in a way so that they preempted the law preempts state regulation which is not and and one of the reasons it does that is to uh to permit the exchanges to operate without running a foul of what were then 
um, in more conservative states, uh, anti-gambling and wagering rules. And, and the fear that if you didn't have that protection, that the contracts could be set aside, that, which would be, uh, would potentially have a systemic effect. But the bankruptcy rules, and I mean, they're very complex and you can't discuss them all now, but the beauty of them are, and they were copied everywhere, really was that if you had paid margin into a central market and uh, there was no fraud, but there was a default that prevented the ability to complete transactions, that they could move the products to another healthy uh, participant in the market with the money, even though the firm was insolvent. And that was a real innovation. So that was a huge game changer. And we're going to come back to how you were part of that team that were game changing and really set the rules internationally. Let's just say, Andrea, hello to a few people who are watching. Marcus Ward, it's such a joy to see you. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope all is well in your world. It's great to see you once again. We've got a message from Women On It who will be, well, they'll be on their channel tomorrow, one hour earlier, midday Eastern time. Great to see an amazing role model. Hashtag Women On It, hack the future. Excellent. Thank you very much for that message. And speaking of amazing women role models, we've now got, well, I don't know, what is that role model to role model exchange here happening? Greetings, Andrea from Chicago. And that comes from, I think, everybody's favorite female commodities, Diane Anberg. And it's lovely to hear from you this evening. Hopefully you'll have a question later for Andrea. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching the show, give us a little love. We always appreciate that. And the algorithms, the <laughs> all that wonderful AI, it tends to thrive off the basis of love. And therefore, any sort of like is good because Andrea is going to give us so much more insight as we go along. And I mean, Andrea, it's interesting. So you're talking about the the background. I mean, essentially, domestic U.S. commodity markets and derivatives, they were they were originally handled by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And then this decision was made to set up a separate independent agency, the, the CFTC, in a fashion similar to, but subtly different from, the SEC. And that happened, what, in like 1974-75? Correct. Correct. And I, I hope this is an entree that allows me to explain why this really happened. Because, you know, in, in some markets to this day, the, uh, the derivatives on commodities, uh, the financial der derivatives remain subject to ministries that regulate agricultural uh, markets or uh, industry markets. So, and, and that's an indication really that derivatives are different from securities and they're different in many ways. But why, why was, why the CFTC, why did they expand it from just domestic agricultural commodities to uh, coverage by an independent agency that was broader? Well, one reason was it didn't cover that the existing agency didn't cover all the products that were being sold in the U.S. markets, because there were markets that were based on world commodities like uh, metals and and uh, and coffee, sugar and cocoa, which were sort of international agricultural commodities that w in which there were, were were was trading in the U.S., but it wasn't subject to regulation. And there could have been customer protection and market integrity issues there. Secondly, it was formed right after uh, Nixon had left the Bretton Woods Accord, so we were no longer had the dollar pegged to, uh, you know, to uh, price of gold, and uh, there was serious inflation, and uh, the father, of, one of the fathers of futures, really, but the father of, of innovative futures markets, uh, Richard Sandor, said, well, we can use... Uh, futures and derivatives to hedge risk and price changes in financial markets. And there was interest in that and, and the ability to do it because inflation was high and that required that caused various markets to take the usury laws off. There was also a geopolitical issue because the uh, government of the U.S. had given subsidies with respect to Russian grain. Does that sound familiar? And uh, 
And <laughs> this led to a book called The Great Grain Robbery. And finally, there was fraud and manipulation. And that included so-called London option scandals, which were neither, they were neither in London nor were they options. They were bucket shops and the silver manipulation. So this is, and, and then there was competition to create a market then make bigger markets and more interest in markets. Yeah. Wow. Well, that, that's a cornucopia of possible crime there. So the, the silver manipulation, are you referring therefore to the, the, the Hunt brothers or was that an earlier silver manipulation? No, I'm referring to the Hunt brothers, which, which culminated in 1979 yes. on silver, silver Thursday, I think. Yeah. Yes, quite quite incredible altogether. I remember I remember actually talking to a Chicago broker many years later, and he famously had gone in, argued quite strenuously with the Hunt bro brothers, and eventually they'd said, "We're going to give you this money back on the basis that we'll never do business with you again." At which point in time, he couldn't sign the paperwork fast enough to get out the door with the money, get back to his headquarters, and of course, the Hunt brothers ultimately went quite spectacularly bankrupt as a result of their rather curious corner. I'd say it's a great piece of history. Now we've got another awesome woman joining the show, Mary Ann Callahan. Hi, Andrea and Patrick. Greetings from New York. Oh, Marianne, it's lovely to see you today. K-pop hearts all round. Fabulous to see all these incredible women from our commodity settlement, all aspects of the, the, the different areas of, of markets, all here to watch Andrea this evening. Absolutely fabulous. So, I mean, Andrea, you, you then... You alluded to how you got to the CFTC because it was over these special bankruptcy rules. But... It is interesting. I mean, you're talking about Richard Sander there. We're looking forward, actually, to the doc. She'd be joining us for a future program as well, as will be, in fact, Anne Berg, I do believe. And Mary Ann Callahan, you're invited. Don't forget. But looking at the the issues that, that you know, are going on here, it must have been very interesting because the futures markets suddenly going financial and expanding so quickly in the mid and late 1970s and beyond, it clearly created, wow, a lot of work for you to try and educate people in Washington, D.C. before you got your international role. Yes, I mean, it was it was like a trial by fire, really. I think, you know, there was always some crisis occurring at the at 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 the under the under the umbrella of the CFTC's authority and i mean if you start from the beginning we had this big fight about one minute timing which completely sounds ridiculously ridiculous now where we have nanosecond timing but then you know the the exchanges were fighting one minute timing and that was like blood and death fight you know and um and uh then there were issues relative to the changes that were made in 1982, which really made it clear that they, because it was going to be an international market, that the CFTC could change how it, how it addressed access to the U.S. market from outside the U.S. And this resulted in a, another innovative project, which really preceded the establishment of the of the Office of International Affairs, and that was the Part 30 exception, which allowed people who who met certain criteria and and uh, and and uh, signed up with the NFA to uh, do business on foreign products directly to the U.S. under their foreign license, and and uh, uh, Part 30, and also resulted in a lot of, of uh, no action positions that permitted uh, foreign borders trade to ac to to uh, permit electronic access to their markets. Yes, it's 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 quite a fascinating set of set of I mean a cornucopia of events was happening because also then in the background there was that amazing cross-agency competition that suddenly cropped up. Not so much competition, I suppose that's an unreasonable word, but a desire for clarity because the at the same time as the CFTC was being formed, 
the equity options exchanges such as SIBO were being created effectively. I mean, actually, a, almost exactly the same time what SIBO was created in 73, CFTC's created 74, 75. And that caused all sorts of issues because you had clearly commodity futures options were going underneath the CFTC. But then these new financial products like currencies and so on, they were going to the CFTC. And there was all, all manner of debate and dispute. And then ultimately a lovely accord was created as to who would be regulating the equity stock options and who would be regulating the stock indices. Yes, the famous, uh, depending who you work for, the Shad Johnson. Shad was the was the uh, head of the U.S. Uh, SEC at the time. And Johnson, Philip Johnson, was the head of the CFTC. And they developed an accord to uh, divide up uh, the trading of, uh, or oversight of the trading of derivatives based on on equity securities. So if it was a broad-based index, then it would be subject to the CFTC. And if it was a narrow-based index, it would be subject to the uh, SEC. And I would say this was it's also a very innovative arrangement because uh, instead of, you know, coming from the uh, Congress down, because of the complexity, this really came from the from the independent agencies up, the the Congress was very happy to be able to adopt a arrangement that made sense that the agencies had already agreed would be would be workable. And that's uh, now, of course, these rules have been changed over time, and they're way more complex now. But but it was both innovative from the point of view of process and innovative from the point of view of of developing. Uh, these indexes. And I would point out that, you know, the people who developed the first stock index took it to the SEC first, and the SEC said, we don't do this. <laughs> How fascinating. So, so, so just uh, refresh my adult mind. I'm going to make a guess. Was that the, the, the value line and Kansas City Board of Trade, or who was it took the first stock index future to the uh, the, the SEC? That was it. It was I the guess value correctly, line. Do I? Gosh, yeah, you did. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Kansas so, I, I, that's, City. Thank you. Still there. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> In a way, yeah. Kansas, Kansas City Board of Trade. It, it's just, it's quite remarkable how they were uh, they were in the forefront of such innovation, but ultimately didn't quite manage to prevail in the uh, in the great battle for, for dominance the world over. It, it, it's an incredible story that altogether. But I didn't realize that they'd first taken it to the SEC and been told no, there was no room at the inn for that one, and they were sent off back to uh, to the other smaller agency. The agency, which, as I seem to recall, was described by Ronald. Reagan as his favorite government agency on the basis that I think your budget was so relatively modest compared to various leviathans in huge pan-global industries like chemicals and other things at that point in time. Um, interesting aside here from Martin Watkins. Hello, Martin, another IPO vid alumnus joins us. Patrick Young, absolutely agree. The City of London will benefit greatly from the innovative mind of Alderman Professor Michael Minnelli following his election as 695th Lord Mayor. Well, he's looking forward to another astounding, outstanding IPO vid with Andrea Corker, and I think we're already delivering that without a problem. Martin, sorry I didn't get to your comment earlier, but yes, here, here, Michael Minnelli is going to be, I think, a fabulous person who's going to get a great deal done in his year as Lord Mayor, and I know you and I are both big supporters of him having attended the Sheriff's Ball with him just uh, a year or so ago. So, Andrea, I mean, it was an incredibly frenzied time, and ultimately, therefore, this move was created in the CFTC that the CFTC, having done a great deal and still seeing a huge workload in Washington, D.C. and across the United States, you needed an international affairs office. So explain to me how that came about and, and what the work was of, of that office as you went forward. Well, the, the work of the International Affairs Office was really just uh, to, I think, was to move what was, when it was in the tr Division of Trading and Markets, which I headed, there was a lot of international uh, uh, regulatory writing and, and uh, thinking 
with respect to policy, but what I think happened was the desire to operationalize the international program because, you know, beginning with uh, uh, the early 1980s, there were there were a proliferation of exchanges all over the world, or there were the conversion of, of exchanges that had just done commodities to exchanges that also did financial instruments, and there were, uh, ch- you know, products that were the same on both markets. So you needed someone to operationally be, you know, sharing information and so- surveying those markets. But you also wanted someone who could be present at the policy making meetings where they were looking at what should be the principles that govern uh, trading in these types of products uh, wherever they're traded. And I think that it was quite interesting because a lot of the very first thinking um, outside of enforcement on surveillance was the, the, it was done with the CFTC and with the OSCO, but it was done um, really in the context of, of wanting rules that apply to derivatives types products because, and to have some general consensus on that, because when a lot of them were offered, most of the, countries out there didn't have rules and they wanted to have something to be able to say to people who were trying to come into their markets, you know, what rules or what ideas or what standards they should have to abide by. And, and it has to be said, I, I think that was an incredible service delivered by the, the CFTC because you advanced markets all the way around the world. I don't want to name any particular countries because it sounds like for some reason I'm suggesting they were, but your ability to arrive with a kind of flat pack series of FAQs, as I suppose we would call them nowadays, which helped people develop markets so quickly. And that was stunning, whether it was in Europe or Southeast Asia, or in fact, anywhere across the world. I mean, across those five continents in which you're still advising people to this day. Well, I do think that it's interesting because there wasn't a lot that, you know, they didn't agree with us on many things. Um, they, they did, certainly in London, they were very unhappy with our application of our segregation rules. And um, this, this led to some very nice meetings that I had in places like the Silver Room of the, of the Bank of England and the Mercantile Room where they had a, a trade winds clock. But, uh, you know, then we got down to the nitty gritty and that was innovative really too in in the United States system, because in the United States system, you always had, you know, people at the top, the diplomats, the the uh, Congress, and, and then you had the worker bees who were doing the work. But what happened in this international area is you had to have some way to address problems that were occurring and to get information. And you needed that to be done by the people who were the worker bees who were who were actually in the position to use that information. And, and what that meant is you really had a, a group of experts who were putting together rules. And if you'll see, the first set of principles that were put together were the principles for screen-based trading of electronic systems. That was really prompted by Globex and the, and the rise of Globex. And I noticed that that, that set of principles was, rep- that was done in 1990 and it was republished with uh, four amendments in 2000 by Yosco. I mean, it was it's in so both cases, it was published by, by Yosco. Yes. But, yeah. But it, it well, gathered I mean, together it's very the people in the countries, yep. you know, who were in, yes, that, go ahead, in, go ahead. in that venue. Yeah, because it wasn't, because the securities people didn't really do market surveillance in the same way. And they didn't, they didn't have to do information sharing at the time in the same way because, and they didn't have the capacity, I don't think on, on under securities law to alter how things operate by contract. Because one of the first things that happened when the foreign markets decided or the non-US markets decided they were gonna have these contracts and clearing is they didn't have rules that permitted, they didn't have laws that permitted them to establish that once you did a transaction, the transaction was final and couldn't be set aside or reversed. And what they did at the time is they found that they could do that by contract law. And that because 
futures are traded, they're basically contracts, they're standardized contracts that are based on underlying reference prices that are supposed to use the terms and conditions and conventions of those markets, and that they could use the power of the contract to create rules of a market that would bind the people so that even if you didn't have a, a, a statewide or Europe-wide or a US-wide rule that said this was finality, you could say anybody participating in this market, it was going to be finality for them because that was a contract in the marketplace to which they'd signed up. And therein lies the ability of many people the world over to trust futures markets full stop. That with the, the central counterparty clearing house, which has always proved to be the perfect buyer to every seller and seller to every buyer. And of course, those things are all based, as we're talking today with Andrea Corcoran, all about the fabulous history and development of the CFTC. Core issues which date all the way back to Adam Smith and our book of the week this week I'm delighted to bring to you is something that we were talking about with our guest Eamon Butler just a number of weeks ago when we were celebrating the 300th anniversary of Adam Smith's birth. The best book on the market, How to Stop Worrying and Love the Free Economy, is a fabulous read wherever you are in the world, ladies and gentlemen. It's a super book. It was debuted as our book of the week in Exchange and Best Weekend last weekend. And of course, if you'd like to see what's going to be our next book of the week, you can sign up free for the Exchange and Best Weekend edition, where we look at some more macro topics around the world and a little bit of light and interesting, if thought-provoking, reading from around the world. We don't necessarily agree with it, but it's always thought-provoking. And of course, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, you can always read Exchange Invest Daily for all of the news, whether it's the SBF trial, which also, of course, is in our sub stack version, which is all about the business of digital markets and bit carnage, which is, of course, our term of reference for the current version 1.0 of the crypto economy. So Exchange Invest Daily, bit carnage, or indeed the week, the weekend edition, always worth looking at. Ladies and gentlemen, sign up now via exchangeinvest.com. And indeed, the best book in the market, a fabulously readable book, thanks to that wonderful expert from the Adam Smith Institute, Eamon Butler. So, Andrea, I mean, looking at all of these prognoses, I mean, Globex, it's very interesting to think that we are what? Now, it's 30 years since we saw the early days of Globex effectively coming along and, and effectively building the first international cross-border platform. That must have been, well, thought-provoking and challenging from the perspective of every regulator, but particularly the CFTC, as it was the CME that pulled the Globex Alliance together. Yes, it's very it's very thought provoking. I mean, I went back and looked at uh, the beginning of these markets, and I also looked at the rise of uh, of uh, of uh, activity in these markets. And uh, I think the the rest of the world was worried about Globex, uh, and it's you know, and the scope of Globex, and so that precipitated, I think, more move to to uh, electronic markets out, outside the US, although they didn't replace the floor anytime soon. But I was reading today, and I don't know if you could trust Investopedia because I I, uh, I didn't have access to all the uh, data I wanted. But what one thing that, that futures markets do produ produce is data. And, and uh, I read that as much as 80% of the activity on these markets or more is done on Globex electronically. So that was, that was more or less a surprise to me. The other thing I looked at was I looked at commitment of traders, which may not be the best uh, measure because I, but they started in 1986. And, um, and then I looked at the, the, uh, the volume in 1986, and then I looked at the volume uh, today uh -huh. in, in, in 2023. And uh, while it's not, vol it's not volume, it's open interest, you see quite a bit of change. You know, in crude oil futures, the open interest in 1986 was 74,000 contracts, uh, more or less. And in, in 2023, it was 
um, almost a million and a half. And the amount of traders was very limited because I guess the volume is is goes on during the day, but the the there's a lot of day trading and it's not carried over. And then I looked at the yen and in in 86, the yen had 23,000 and in January of 23, they had 172,000 euro dollars, which may change. I don't know. In January of 86, there were 138,000 contracts, open interest. And on a specific date in 23, the open interest was more than 6 million. And, and uh, so you can see there was just a general huge growth in, in this area. And then because the contracts or similar contracts were duplicated, there was a huge need to share, to share information about what was going on. And uh, I mean, if you look at when many of these markets started and when they became really more sophisticated, a lot of it happened in 1986, 1987, 1989. So, so what were the, the particular catalysts to those moves in the course of 86, 80, 88, 89? Apart from the fact, of course, that in 86 through 87, we had an incredible bull market, then a huge market stock market crash, which uh, caused a lot of excitement around the circuit breaker issue. And then, of course, 88, 89, we saw an incredible resurgence in those markets, even though Japan was peaking at the time, never to come back during the course of the rest of our lifetime so far. Well, I think I think they wanted to be competitive. They didn't want to be they and they wanted to but i think it wasn't you know it wasn't without controversy if you look at japan for example i believe that japan's biggest market its biggest agricultural market is rice but i i don't know to this day whether they have a rice futures contract because rice is sort of a sacred underlying um contract i think uh or it's 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 not just rice it's something more mystical if you look at uh, if you look at uh, say France, some people say the the marché uh, a term a term you know the Matif. I think it had trouble yes, being the successful. Yeah, it had trouble being successful at the beginning, um, and and ultimately these markets, you know, they 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 formed and reformed for different reasons. I think. If you look at Germany, Germany did not, did not like it that the life was trading the Bund. And that's really spurred, you know, the Deutsche Terminobus to have their own contract. And the same thing happened with Italy. Italy had a different way of trading um, uh, sovereign debt. I mean, they traded on a market system rather than a principles-based system. And they said, well, we didn't, they don't want it being traded on London either as the principal market. So you saw all this competition to be in the game. Singapore in 1984 was when CIMEX was, was formed. And it was the same time that they did a deal with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to have a link that would allow them to mutually offset, put a, put a trade on in one exchange and offset it on another exchange. So there was... You know, they wanted to be in the game. Let's put it that way. Yes, everybody wanted to be in the game. And that, and that was certainly the great excitement of the late 1980s. Everybody was launching a, uh, a futures market. Good grief, the Irish even launched the Irish Futures and Options uh, Exchange, IFOX. And there was, another, there was another Irish futures market which was going to be launched where they bought the cinema in Dublin where only... 10 or 12 years earlier, a very, very much smaller Patrick Young had enjoyed watching the Irish debut of You Only Live Twice, the James Bond movie, which was uh, something that I don't think they were intending to show during trading sessions. But anyway, we have got, I've got to say tonight, it's the most amazing gathering of power ladies in and around the derivatives business we've had in all of our 119 episodes so far. Lisa Sam has just checked in. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Lisa. It's lovely to see you watching. Uh, it's great that 
you're here to support Andrea. Absolutely awesome guest indeed. Thank you so much for checking in. And in fact, we've got a question from another of those power ladies, Anne Berg. If you have time, we've always got time for you, Anne Berg. Can you expand on the challenges arising from regulatory arbitrage, given the explosive growth of global capital and derivatives markets, particularly since 2000 AD? Well, they don't call it AD anymore. <laughs> I've, it's 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 the past. What the central era? In any event, I mean this question on arbitrage. I think is difficult. I think today that people are looking for the best price of the most liquid market, and that 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 there have been some some measures to try to offer sort of second secondary markets or less less. Uh, uh, I would say less restrictive or less regulated markets. I, I'm more familiar, frankly, on the security side in this than on the commodity side. And and my experience is that these have not, have had modest or mixed results. Like you know, the second tier markets. If you call it a second tier market, then you say to yourself as a as a participant, well, I'm not a second tier participant. Why am I participating in a second tier market? And even some of the financial uh, international centers, they've had, they 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 have a great idea. You know, they want to bring uh, high quality of regulation there, but they don't. If they don't bring the liquidity, then they don't bring, and they don't bring a fair price. Then ultimately, I think, and and the two are related, of course. Then I don't think they succeed that well. And I guess one question is, will the changes that are going on now, now in in London, that are intended to um, liberalize and and alter what was done in the European Union, whether whether that and seating their seat at the top table is going to work for their favor or work against them, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, they've always been successful in the past, so I I wish them the best of luck in those markets. But I think that uh, I I think that. You know, there's economic arbitrage, but I don't see so much regulatory arbitrage unless we're talking about, you know, crypto and all these invented markets. And I'm not supposed to talk about that. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Hanberg, for that great question. And indeed, well, rather than talk about invented markets, let's have a quick segue, ladies and gentlemen, and give at least a one minute rest to our brilliant guest here today, Andrea Corcoran. We're going to look at what I'm getting up to this weekend because it's a return for me, not to introducing IPO vid, but actually getting back to my great passion for old racing cars. And I'm going to be well, commentating this weekend on the latest edition of the Amdina Grand Prix. Here's a preview. After a wait of four long years, historic racing returns to the streets of Malta. Join us at the Amdina Road Circuit this weekend, October 7th and 8th, for the pinnacle of Maltese motorsport, the Amdina Grand Prix, fueled by Enamed. My name is Patrick L. Young, and I'll be your lead commentator for what promises to be a fabulous conclusion to the Malta Classic Weekend. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. And actually, the most exciting thing is that I do believe we have this evening live in the studio a veteran, no less, of the Mila Melia. Andrea, tell us all about it. Yes, it was one of the great experiences of my life. We have friends who are uh, who who have wonderful antique cars and they vintage cars and they they uh, run rallies themselves all the time. But at any rate, they invited me to participate in the Mila Milia, and I was participated in a Bugatti as a navigator, not a driver. But uh, it, it was. It was a fabulous experience. It was like being a celebrity. I mean, you went to Brescia and you got to see all the beautiful cars. And if they'd been messed with, if they'd been, if they weren't totally unique uh, to the proper uh, parts of the time, they would be kicked out of the race. And um, I was quite into it. Uh, in fact, my driver was a bit, 
bit upset that I was uh, giving my uh, autograph to people when we stopped at pit stops to get gas. But it was it was an amazing, amazing experience. And, and the way it was organized, you know, uh, because it's a thousand miles, you know, it was was uh, something to see. And, and we were told it's never won by anybody except an Italian. So then you take a, a relaxed view. It's a regular re, regularity run. It's not a race anymore because of the, the racer who was killed or the, that caused uh, the accidents that they had before years ago. But it's a fabulous thing. If you ever have a chance, take it. <laughs> What an incredible experience. Yes, the, the, the Mille Miglia, a thousand miles tradition of going from Brescia in the north of Italy to Rome and back. And it used to be a straight out fight to the finish. The excitement being that they used to start the smallest cars, things like the Fiat 500 in the 1950s. They'd go off actually the night before all the way up to midnight. It wouldn't be until 7 15, 7, 20, 7, 30 in the morning that they let loose the greatest Ferraris, Maseratis, and of course the incredible Maserati, the incredible Mercedes 300 SLR of 1955, which won in the fastest time ever, driven by the incredible Sir Sterling Moss, uh, recently departed from, from us. And of course, if you ever have the chance, ladies and gentlemen, go read the best piece of motoring journalism ever, which was Dennis Jenkinson, his navigator in that event, discussing the whole possibility of the event. And of course, tragically, yes, the Mille Miglia finished in 1957 after a spectacular accident, only a few miles after the Marquis von de Portago had stopped to kiss his glamorous Italian film star lover. <laughs> While in the middle of the race, he sped off into the distance, said ciao, ciao, and unfortunately had a spectacular accident which killed a large number of spectators who were in a forbidden zone. A tragedy in the making but now an incredible regularity. Doing so in a Bugatti must have been absolutely fantastic given the Franco-Italian pedigree. I'm most jealous, Andrea. You're a woman of so many parts and achievements. It's quite incredible. So coming back to this fascinating tale of, of the CFTC and how it developed, I mean, what was it like living through these various exciting crises because i mean obviously globex was a defining moment not a crisis but you know bearings sumitomo they were just a couple of the major events that happened when you were running the international affairs office yes well actually actually bearings and um it was in 1995 and sumitomo was in 1996 although the the um, the rogue trading went on longer than that. I think that um, we were very lucky that the that the local people in 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 the case of in the case of Singapore that the Singapore authority, the monetary authority of Singapore, and the exchange they 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 came up with a a, a rescue. Uh, but we did find on the on the U.S. side that what people had done is they had placed their U.S. orders onto the Singapore market through London traders, in the event in in the attempt to sort of limit their obligation for customer segregation. And so we did what we always do when there's a crisis at the CFTC, which is to form a committee to see whether there was a way to improve uh you know information about people participating in the market and what their uh financial capacity was across markets when people were interested and that resulted in the windsor accord and then the windsor accord uh resulted in a uh a declaration which was signed in boca by 16 uh foreign jurisdictions and it was also signed by 49 different uh, markets under the auspices of the Futures Industry Association. And, and basically, it, it was recognizing the complexity of these markets and the need to share information, the need to have the information quickly. But as importantly, it set up networks so when the next time there was a problem, you had the right people to talk to and you could resolve questions and problems 
uh, as quickly as possible under the circumstances. The same thing with Sumitomo. Sumitomo was also the result of a, of a, uh, a rogue trader. I mean, the CFTC was one of the first places to actually say you need to have uh, brokers have uh, internal controls that that uh, that causes them to look for what's happening in in uh, error accounts. Uh, Sumitomo was also in a product where, if you looked at what happened in Chile when they traded copper, uh, they did they didn't market to market every day. And we d didn't allow that in the U.S. for our commodity market. You had to settle every every day or more frequently than every day. So you were limiting your overall exposure. So we felt we could co contribute to, um, you know, the, the international sector on what ought to be uh, uh, the design of contracts, how they're traded, how the terms are disclosed how they should be surveyed and what types of large trader and financial information should be shared across uh, markets. And this was a very uh, robust conversation. Everyone didn't agree all at once, but I think that if you look at the results, if you look at some of the work, and it was also taken up by IOSCO, they did a guidance on information sharing. That's as valid today as it was at the time. Yeah, I mean, you had a great pedigree of working with IOSCO over the course of course of several decades. You've mentioned it earlier. But how did the what they call the independent agency structure of, of the U.S., did that complicate relations? Well, I know this is an enthusiasm of yours, Patrick. I mean, to me, first of all, an independent agency is only independent of the of the executive. And the idea there is it's supposed to be uh, under the oversight of the of the entity, which is Congress, that's delegated them operational authority to do things that Congress itself obviously can't can't do. It's like, you know, Congress can give you power and tell you, you need to have things like capital, but Congress doesn't want to do the auditing. They have to have somebody who's on the spot to do that. In the old days, I would say uh, that uh, the independent agencies, and, and I would say even today, if you look at the people in the high level positions in the agencies, the people are actually running the work and doing the work. Those people are not, they're not politically, they're not, they're not political. And the fact that there are changes at the top, they don't, they may change, um, you know, direction, I would say, um, you know, and sometimes when there's a change in direction, just like in a market, you could overreach one direction or the other. You could go to make it too rigid or you could make it too, 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 uh, you, you may move too more to, ta to take the rules off. It always seems to me whenever we've just taken the rules off, like in 2007, uh, that we're about to have a crisis and we'll have to put them all back on again. But that's really not a fault of the of the uh, I would say the structure of the agency. Executive. It's more. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think you're right. And actually, I think last year, I mean, given the fact that SBF's trial is happening today, we don't want to talk about crypto per se, but a very, very good example of the excellence of the work within the agencies at both the SEC and the CFTC, amongst other agencies, was how quickly they managed to cooperate to bring charges against uh, Sam Bankman-Fried, FTX, and so on, because they did that within a matter of weeks. And I mean, we've all seen crises, financial debacles, the world over where charges haven't been laid for years after the event taking place. And, and I thought that was a, a stunning example of just how efficient the organization can be. And in fact, praise indeed from Chris Cook. I was there at the birth of AFBD, the Association of Future Broker Dealers, which was the original UK regulator military organization in 1986. And remember Andrea well from my time there and particularly during my time as IPE, Director of Compliance and Market Supervision. One of those great moments in the history of Brent Crude versus West Texas Intermediate, a battle which is still raiding today, albeit the fascinating 
Hydra being, I suppose, Midland crude and a point where we have multiple different benchmarks the world over. Look, Andrea, I'm afraid this has been so good. We're, we're running out of time. So I'm going to ask you that one question that we always like to ask our guests before they go. Andrea Corcoran, where do you think the capital market revolution goes next? Okay. So I have prepared what I consider a reverse uh, SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Starting with the weaknesses, I think, uh, and by the way, I sort of took a poll on this, hidden leverage, hidden leverage, hidden leverage, and unrealized losses, uh, overcommitment to bank deposits that are passive, uh, and forgetting that liquidity has a cost. With respect to politicians, I would say too much turf and marketing and not enough rules of civility and getting the job done. With respect to regulators, uh, why is there a move to assume that every international intermediary should be regulated like a bank? Um, even the EU found that maybe for insurance that wasn't the right thing to do. I think um, banks and, uh, you know, asset, asset management companies are quite different. But there are lots of opportunities uh, to increase access to finance through new technology and to mobilize capital to promote innovation and growth and economic health. And I've, we've done it in the past, and I think we can do it again. And sort of as a coda, I would like to channel as my final word uh, based on Abigail Adams, who was uh, the wife of one of our founding fathers, who she said to her husband, don't forget the ladies when she made the Constitution. But I have another plea because the ladies were all here today. My plea is please don't forget the humans. We still make things happen and we make uh, markets great. So that's my final word. Oh, Andrea Corcoran, you bring such heart to the hustle, I have to say, and I'm copying words from Woman on its uh, opening and closing remarks. It's just a joy to have had you on the show today. I agree. Humanity is vitally important and much over underrated when it comes to the business of regulation, the business of markets and the business of much else besides. We've had an incredible gathering of power ladies this evening. We've also had a few fine gentlemen. In fact, I see Chris Cook saying there was a major blind spot at clearing houses, particularly LCH in relation to clients building big positions across multiple brokers. Yes, one of many fascinating and huge issues that we've had emerge during the course of time. All stories which, of course, you have lived through uh, from your position, your vaunted vantage point over those several exciting decades at the head of the international office of the, the CFTC. It's been an absolute joy to have you today, Andrea Corker, and joining us to be discussing Going Global, the birth of the CFTC. You're very, very welcome, John T. He's saying what a very interesting show this has been. Thank you very much. Thank you for checking in. And indeed, let me thank all of our contributors today. Marcus Ward, Anne Berg, Woman On It, Martin Watkins, Lisa Sem, Marianne Callahan, Chris Cook, and of course, John T. I also want to thank our fantastic, powerful production team today. Ladies, Herminia, Mary and Marianne, you've been absolutely awesome. But best of all has been our guest. Going Global, the birth of the CFTC from, I have to say, probably the finest piece of interior decor that we've yet seen for a guest in 119 <laughs> shows, Andrea Corcoran, and a veteran of the Mila Milia, no less too. You always surprise me every time we chat. Andrea, it's an absolute joy having you on the show. Thank you very, very much. Next week, we're going to be going on the road talking about commodities markets with Rod Blondin. He's the man who essentially drove his way around South South Africa, discussing, selling, and turning the South African farmers into futures hedgers. It's a fascinating story, one that really complements beautifully with our tales this evening from Andrea's time at the CFTC. I look forward to that show. Thank you once again, Andrea. Thank you to all our production team. Thank you, viewers, for watching. My name is Patrick L. Young. As always, Anberg, thank you and see you soon. And more importantly, Anberg, we'll
to you soon on this show. We're really, really excited. Looking forward to that. We've got a strong commodities fall coming up in the IPO vid series. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick L. Young, wishing you a great week in life and markets. Thank you very much and have a super time. See